question. What do you do when you don't measure up to what you want to be known for? So if you put that up on the slide. What do you do when you don't measure up to what you want to be known for? What happens when you project yourself to be known for something and you don't make it? You do what I do. You do what we all do. You pretend. We pretend and we make excuses and then if we're totally honest with ourselves, we criticize other people to bring them down to our level so we don't feel the pain of what we are really like. And we can even start to get into this thing of misleading people about ourselves and being dishonest. And we've all got caught up to one degree or another of managing our image, right? <laughs> and we, we, we do that. There's been a lot of research about this lately because of social media, but research shows that we love to talk about ourselves. And usually that's about 60% of our conversations they found. And then when it goes on to social media, it, it spikes up to 80% and even higher. And they found that they, there's a neurological process that's taking place that when you start talking about yourself, there's, there, it fires up part of your brain that's the same part of your brain that fires up when you eat pizza. <laughs> 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 Isn't this great? Uh, cooked me. Uh, I brought this frozen pizza, you know, the cardboard pizza. Uh, brought that home the other night. And it's like 11 o'clock. And it's like, I'm going to eat that whole thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> put it in there. And I cooked it up. I only ate half of it. I felt good about myself. But it just, I like pizza. And we like to talk about ourselves sometimes. And it's pleasurable. And I don't think that's all bad. I just think that... Much of our social media, much of our personal relationships, we manage our image. And nobody really gets to know what the real you is like. And we all do it. We all fall into that. And I'm not sure that we have a lot of environments that would bring out the real you. Um, so when I manage my image, what I do is, and this is what I did on Facebook, I carefully selected what I wanted to be projected. And that's what we do when we say things, when we converse with other people. We, we carefully select what we, and we don't all, we kind of hold back what, what is really going on sometimes. And, except for my, my father. <laughs> my dad got on Facebook. And I was like, my dad's 86. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> now I know what my kids feel like. You know, dad's on Facebook. Oh, and they went to Instagram. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and dad got on Facebook, and, and he's just completely integral. Is that the word? He's just who he is. And if you go to my dad's home, and you get to meet him after the first greetings, you will hear about geology. You'll hear about all kinds of geology that's way above your head. You won't have any idea what he's talking about, but he's having a good time. And that's what he does on Facebook. He just puts all of his life travels all over the world and puts it on Facebook. And it's extremely interesting, the part that I understand. And I think sometimes we're not as good about being ourselves as Dad is sometimes. We just want to hold back and we just don't want people to know us. And that's a problem. You know why? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but nobody can really like you until they know who you really are. So I just want to seed that thought in our minds right now. Is they, you think they like you, but they just like the image that you protected, that you projected. They don't know what you're really like until you give some of the real stuff going on there. And then that's always risky, isn't it? Because if you give the real stuff, and that's why we don't do it, because we don't know if we're going to be rejected. We don't know if they'll choose to like us. And that's really the bottom line. We hold back because we don't know if people are going to like us if they knew what we were really like. And that becomes a problem. So many lonely people 
in our culture today, and social media doesn't do it. I mean, I, I, I'm, this isn't a message to come against social media because that's, that's not my purpose at all. It's just the, the purpose I'm trying to get at is how do we create the environments where we can be ourselves and really be liked and be known and allow other people to know us. They used to have a front porch. They used to have a front porch. And in the old days, they would come out on the front porch and they would talk and the neighbors would gather there and they would cook and they would do different things, play games and stuff, and they would talk about things there on the front porch and that's gone. It's, it no longer exists. If you see that or if you do that, it's very rare. And now they found out that what people are doing is, is called cocooning. And they cocoon. So they go to work and, they, and because of life these days, and you know it, we experience it, we all know what this is like. We go to work and, and we feel the pressure and the demands on us and it saps us and it saps our strength physically, emotionally, every way, spiritually. And then you go home to your cocoon. <laughs> And you go home and he's like, okay, I'm going to take care of my appetites now, my food appetites and my entertainment appetites. And we, we do that, whether it be on social media, whether it be on television or movies or whatever. And, we, we, and I'm not saying that that's all wrong. I, I think that there's a place for that. To kind of veg out and just chill out. And, and uh, uh, as that one guy says in the marriage things, the, 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 what's that box? The, the nothing box. Men have a nothing box. And women hate that. <laughs> I got a big nothing box. And I said, what are you thinking? Nothing. And I'm just not thinking about anything. <laughs> but we cocoon, and that's fine to rest and all that kind of thing. But if that's all we do, if that's all I do, if I just cocoon, and I don't go in those environments where I can share myself and be known and take the risk that this person may not like me if they really know what I'm like, and then hear from other people your stories, the stories of other people, so that I can choose to accept them. If I don't go into those environments and I just concoon, then I will never be liked. Because it's impossible to be liked until you risk and you share. All right. Let's put slide number five up. The more you manage your image, the less genuine. You can write that down in your handout if you want, choose to or what. The more you manage your image, the less genuine you will become. And if you're not genuine, you can't experience meaningful friendships. Slide number six says, the more I pretend, the less I will grow. When we pretend, we don't grow, we don't get better, we just pretend. And the reality is this, if I present myself one way, to whatever degree that I'm not really that way, then I have to pretend to make up the difference. However, to be completely transparent, that's not the goal either. I'm not, that shouldn't really, that shouldn't be our goal. You know, if I've acted unkindly at home to my wife, the one person that I love the most, you probably don't need to hear that most of the time, unless it's part of a point or something. But you really don't want to see the things that Diane and I have gone through. <laughs> Do you really? No, you don't want to see that. I mean, I can illustrate it. And we can talk about it. I, but that's not the point is just to air all our dirty laundry. That's not the point of this. Um, by the way, I, I will say that Diane and I just celebrated our 31st anniversary. Isn't that awesome? 
That woman has put up with a lot. I got the good end of that deal. Most of the time. Most of the time. But we're going to actually take our uh, few days and we'll be here on the weekends, but we're going to take a few days and we're going to spend a few bucks and go to Lake Tahoe. I've never been there. And uh, go there for one, one evening and then we're going to hike over to Northern California for a couple of days at a conference there at Bethel Church and looking forward to that. So uh, that's coming down the pike for us. We're excited about that. But our goal is not to air out all our dirty laundry. We, we have that, but, that's, but the goal is not to be absolutely transparent. The goal is this. The goal is to be genuine. What do I mean by that? The goal is just simply not trying to hide. If, if we have some places of, of difficulty, we'd be glad to talk to you about it. And if you do, I'm glad to listen. That's being genuine. Why is it that, this is just my observation, all right? And I may be wrong, but after 30 some odd years in ministry, why is it that the church is the hardest place to be genuine? Can we be different here? Seriously. Can we just be real? Not so that we're just hanging out all our stuff, but, but that we're here for each other. And that we build friendships that are meaningful. That they're real, they're sincere, they're genuine. It's a hard target, but I think we can get there. And I think you guys have shown that you, that's an important value. That yeah, you're not trying to be perfect. You're trying to grow. But you want to be there for each one of us. And for each other. And that's the goal. So my point in bringing all this out right now is just to say that, that we need to be aware of the pressures that we put on one another. To be something that we're not. It's really difficult to live a different way. Because you go out of these doors and there's so much pressure at work to be something that you're not. There's so much pressure even... Some, sometimes there's a lot of pressure in your marriage to be something that you're not. Sometimes there's a lot of pressure in, in other relationships to be something that you're not. And we forget that Jesus just accepts you the way that you are. That Jesus will take you right where you are and take you one step at a time to the next step that you need to be. He loves you right where you are and he doesn't force you to be anything that you're not and he'll take you, he'll empower you to get to that next step. It's one day at a time, one week at a time, one year at a time. How many of you could just say that you're glad where you are now compared to where you were last year? Oh, isn't that awesome? That's the grace of God. That's the mercy of God. And we need to treat each other that way too. It's like, yeah, there's some things that, that can I use this? I, I don't know what I'm going to say either. But there's some things that she doesn't like about me, but she loves me. That's, that's safe, right? <laughs> I better not go any further. But that's what love is really built on is that acceptance. And the Bible says to accept one another as Jesus has accepted you. But how do we do that without relationship? How do we do that without building friendships? So kind of look around. There's a lot of people you don't know, probably. We can't really do that here. We can't really do that here in this setting, in this format. This doesn't work. Because, okay, I'll go first. I'll tell you all my secrets. And then we'll just go right down the line. Ah, no, you're like, I'm getting out of here. No, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? But if you have a few people that you can grow in trust with, that's critical. You're not designed to do this alone. None of us are. Hmm. So, if we were to go off the record today, we would all admit that we all have gaps between where we are now and where we want to be. Or put it this way, be, 
be, between where I am now and what I want other people to see me as. Yeah. We all have gaps. We pretend, we hide, we cover up to some extent. And where we pretend the most in public, a lot of times here. Slide number seven. If people like you and they don't really know you, then they don't really like you, they just like your image. That's why Facebook is so popular. It's because you can manage your image there. You really, you know, you really don't know what those people are like. But you can go there and look at mine and see what a great ball player I used to be. <laughs> I'll leave the pictures up just a little bit longer. Um, but the scary part of this is if nobody knows the real me, then I've just dwindled down to who really likes me. Because they don't know me. They just know my image. So until I'm willing to share who I really am, no one can choose to love me. You know that a lot of people fall in love in rehab? Andy Stanley was bringing this out. I thought it was just so interesting. Lots and lots of people fall in love in rehab. And why? Because in rehab, a lot of times, in that dynamic, you're, you're made to reveal yourself. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're there for. If you really want to rehab, then you, you pour your guts out a little bit. And another person pours their guts out. And pretty soon there's a lot of understanding flowing in the room. And pretty soon they're saying, I love you. Will you marry me? <laughs> you know, and, and probably nothing wrong with that either because there's finally based on real truth. You know, uh, it's not a false idea or a false image of one another that doesn't go very far. But just to see the power that understanding another person can bring to them a lot of life just by listening and opening up yourself and sharing. So can we provide that kind of environment? Because I think, and this is part of my passion, I think that of all the places on the face of the earth that the local church, not just ours, but all of them, should provide that. And you still choose. We all just choose what we be a part of, but at least provide it. Try. And that's what we're trying to do, is provide that. So as we head into the small groups for this fall, I just ask you to consider, would you be willing to come and be a part, just a few people, and look at some content, study scripture a little bit, Share some stories, get to know each other. I can't tell you how many times people have just said, man, I didn't really, just, everybody was just a face coming here on the weekend, but then when we got together in a group, then I got to know them, and now I can talk to them when we come together. Would you consider that? Would you pray about it and just say, you know, I'm tired of this aloneness. Maybe you're not lonely, but you're, al- but, but you're, not lonely, but you're alone, and you're tired of being alone in your walk with Christ, well, shouldn't we provide that for each other? That, hey, here's, here's the way I am. I hope you will like me. But here's the way I am. I hope you'll accept me. But here's the way I am. And then another person says, I hope that this isn't too much. I hope that things I share you still like me. <laughs> That's what Jesus told us to do. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you could go back in Jesus' day and hang with him a little bit? Wouldn't it be amazing? Of course, a lot would be demanded on you probably, but what, what, would, that, what would that be like? Well, we can't literally do that. We can't go back in time and do that. But there is something that we can do. We can kind of pick the brain. We can, we can get inside the head of somebody that knew him very intimately, we can see what he had to say about his time with Jesus and some of the instructions to those of us who are trying to follow him now. Now, 
that may not be you. That may you just you're just now exploring your walk with Jesus, or or even just a spiritual journey of some kind. You're, you just kind of got here, and I understand that. I used to be there. I know what that's like. But just listen to something that this person he wasn't one of the twelve. He wasn't one of the twelve disciples. He grew up in the same home as Jesus. Now, what would that be like? I'm a little brother. I'm the youngest of four. And I was always comparing myself to my older brother. Always. And I couldn't wait to beat him in basketball. And I loved it when that day came. What would it be like if your older brother was Jesus? Talk about messing you up, wouldn't it? (laughs) You could never be good enough. (laughs) Oh, wow. Well, James, and along with the rest of his immediate family, they, they all had problems with Jesus. And it wasn't really until after the resurrection, after his death and his resurrection, all of a sudden, it came, all that came about came true. I don't know what happened exactly to James, but can you imagine what that would have been like? He, he's like, man, I don't understand my older brother. He's doing all this kind of thing. It looks good, but he's just crazy and all this kind of thing. And, and then... And then all of a sudden, all, you know, all the upper world, everybody knew who Jesus was. And then he's crucified, he, he's buried, then he rises from the dead. And, and James, his smaller brother, his old, younger brother, had, had this epiphany. Man, Jesus, my older brother, was God. <laughs> what, what was that like? You know, it was God. And, and then he became a teacher. He became a pastor in Jerusalem, the first church. And he knew some things about Jesus. He, all of a sudden it came back. Jesus wasn't like anybody else. He, wasn't, he never put on a show of, of being so spiritual. He didn't do any of that kind of stuff. Oh, and he remembered what he was like growing up with him. And then he began to teach people how to live like Jesus. And he said this, uh, slide 10, James chapter 5, verse, oh, one of those verses in there, says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. How many of you, don't raise your hand, don't even, not, don't even look at me, but how many of you have places that need to be healed? God, that's all of us, isn't it? But this is, here's how we get it. We confess our sins to each other. Now, are you going to do that now? No, don't do that now. But we need that environment. We need to have that to where this is possible. Am I going to be forced to confess my sins? No. It's just an opportunity. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So how do we do that with people that you are learning to trust? So another leader in the church said this in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at slide 11 here. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. I like that word spur. <laughs> I used to work on a farm and there was this electric shock on the end of a stick to work with cows, or not cows, uh, hogs. And those hogs, you know, when they get up to around 500 pounds, they're hard to move. And so they have to be motivated. So you stick them with that and they spur to action a little bit. And then when that didn't work, my, uh, the farmer that I worked for would pick up a two by four. A little more persuasion that way. And uh, so, what do we need? We need this. <laughs> we need spurring on. Because there's a certain amount of lethargy that comes on your walk. Everybody, everyone, including myself. We, we have to be spurred. And the, the best environment for that to happen is when you're face-to-face with other people hearing their stories, they're hearing your story, and we spur one another on. And what are you spurring them on to? Love and good deeds. We get tired of loving people. We get tired of doing what's right. So we need encouragement on both of those, right? Well, I'm getting happy. I don't know if you're getting happy. but Let's look at uh, the rest of that verse. It says, on toward love and good deeds and 
Not giving up, meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So don't, don't let those habits form. Just you know, get in the habit of meeting together like this. And then, uh, uh, then the great Pastor Paul, you know, he was going 180 miles an hour one way. God got a hold of him, turned him around. He was, he was actually uh, uh, beating people up that were following Christ. God got a hold of him, and he started teaching people how to follow Christ. An amazing transformation. Uh, if you ever want to look at success literature, look at the, the life of Paul. It's just amazing. So he writes this to the Galatians who were just starting to follow Christ. He says, Brothers and sisters, if, that's slide 12. I just got part of it up there for you. Uh, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, uh, you who, are, who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Everybody say gently. This is real important here. If someone's caught in a sin, it doesn't mean that they're going around looking and trying to catch people in sin. That's not what, they're, that's not what he's talking about. They used to do some trapping. And, oh, you animal lovers are going to hate this. But, but, Jimmy, you want to talk about trapping? <laughs> <laughs> this is like treading and oh well but I, I did it and I loved it and, but what you do you catch that, that fox's foot or a coyote or whatever and, uh, and it's trying to shake that's what this is talking about when you're not intentionally trying to sin you're not trying to mess up but you just stepped in it and, and it's got you and you're like man I'm going to die if I don't get out of this that's what addictions do to you. They, you. they catch you. And if you've never been addicted to anything, you don't know the power of it. To catch a person and just to drag them. One of the traps is, is to, like for a muskrat, is to trap them underneath and drown them in, in a pond. I'm going to get some hate mail for this. <laughs> but that's, that's what the devil tries to do. It just trap you and throw you in. And drown you in a sea of sin. And so this is saying, when you see somebody like that, do something for them. Help them. Reach out to them. Talk to them. You can only do that through relationship. Are you hearing me? That's the only way. So we got to build those relationships. we got to have those environments. That's why it's so, so critical. It says, if, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit. You, you, in other words, you got it going on pretty good right now. You're not caught right now. Those of you that are not caught, then you might be able to help. And he says, watch yourself so that you not be tempted, so that you don't step in a trap. Because there's always that potential. He said, carry. Everybody say, carry. Carry one another's burdens. Carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Listen to me. You will never be a living, you'll never live a fulfilled life until you fulfill the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? He really made it simple. You know, you don't have to go in the Old Testament and, and look up all the Ten Commandments and all the 600 more commandments there. You don't have to do that. He said, just do this. Love God and love each other like you love yourself. Oh, I, can, I could do that with the strength of Christ. Just love others like I love myself. And love God. So... Carry one another's burden, and this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. So if you say, well, I'm not really a small group kind of person. Yeah, you are. You're in small groups all over the place. Well, I'm just not one to sit in a circle. You need to be. You need to be. Well, I, I, I just, I'm not comfortable. Nobody is. <laughs> I cut my teeth on this to grow spiritually. And man, the first month that I was a Christian, this is years and years and years ago, but the lady that was leading that small group, it was about 12 of us in high school, and that, that lady called me on, in, in account on a couple of things that I was saying. And she, she said, finally, she had enough sensitivity. She said, and because I was, I was just being a snot-nosed teenager not that everybody is that way okay 
I know teens are in here. Man, you guys are a lot better than I ever was, all right? So I qualify that. But I was pretty belligerent at that time. And she said, finally, she just looked me in the eye. She, in the presence of the, my friends, my other 12 friends there, he said, what's going on in your life, Dave? You just seem so angry. Well, I went 0 for 5 <laughs> and 1 for 13, and my coach is hating me pretty good right now. And we lost the conference championship because of that game because I wasn't ready to play. Can we pray for you, Dave? I, this is a little, this is a true story. Can we pray for you? I said, yeah. What do you want us to pray for? Pray that I can hit again. <laughs> pray that I make some baskets. Pray. Next game I broke out. I was like, wow. God answers prayer. You mean he'll answer a prayer for you to make more baskets? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it spoke to me, that God cared. God cared. You know, God cares for your life. And you think it, he doesn't. You, you think he's distant. You, but you get together and you hear each other's stories. And he's like, and you feel the strength that comes from praying for each other. You're reminded, oh, man, he's there. He, he's alive. He's in. He's alive. He's in. He's alive. He's in.